Hey everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in our Come Follow Me lessons, we're studying verses 1 through 26 of the Joseph Smith history. These are some of my most favorite stories from church history. As a quick reminder, I'm not going to be doing the Come Follow Me lesson for you. That's your job. But what I'm going to be doing is sharing the fun, uplifting, exciting, and inspiring, faith-promoting stories from church history that surround the lesson that you're going to be studying this week. It's the story behind the story or the stories behind the history. And I'm going to take you through the history of, of verses 1 through 26 of the Joseph Smith history. Now, don't fall into the trap of thinking, well, I understand the first vision. I have a testimony of its truthfulness. I've heard this story. I've taught this story. I've borne testimony of this story and think that we can kind of cruise through this week without diving deep because the history behind each of these verses in this book of scripture reveals so much history and opportunity for us to liken these scriptures to ourselves. We'll find as we look at the historical stories that Joseph didn't just turn to James 1, 5 and think, I think I'll go into the grove and pray and come out with an answer of what church to join. There's so much behind it that went into him actually going into the grove on that beautiful spring morning early in the spring of 1820. And it's all those little stories leading up to the first vision that I'm going to share with you that make this story so relatable to us in 2021. And by the way, welcome to 2021. Who's ready to say goodbye to 2020? Most people say, let's kick it to the curb. Let's forget 2020. But boy, the things that we can remember and learn and cherish from 2020. Yeah, there were, were so, most of the things, they weren't so good. But some of the things were incredible, like the amount of time I was able to spend with my family, the amount of extra time that was freed up and gave us the opportunity to really focus on our Book of Mormon study and come follow me last, last year. A lot of wonderful silver linings to 2020. But here we are, 2021, studying the Doctrine and Covenants. So here's the agenda. I'm going to take you through all the verses. I'm going to tell you the stories about how the Smiths got to Palmyra, because how the Smiths got to Palmyra, that's one of the greatest miracles of the entire restoration, is just getting the family to Palmyra. And why did they have to get to Palmyra? Because that's where Moroni buried the place. So I'm going to tell you that miraculous story. I'm also going to tell you the stories of leading up to the first vision. What got Joseph thinking along the lines that he needed to approach God and ask the question, which church should I join? And I'll show you that there was more on Joseph's mind than what church to join. This little boy was confused. There were things that were confusing him. And I'm going to show you what he did with that confusion to decipher truth from error and how we can liken that to ourselves. Of course, it's beyond the Come Follow Me lesson. I'm going to be showing you the stories that aren't in the manual. Yeah, they're, they're true. They're fun. They're interesting. And they're so very important. And in hopes of sharing these stories with you, you'll then take that background to these verses, second, verse 1 through 26 of the Joseph Smith history. And now those verses will start to come alive, perhaps in a way they've never come alive before for you in the past. And so I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Here we go. Oh, and then as soon as I get you through all the confusion and stuff and all those stories, and you, you're going to figure out how to liken it to yourself. I'm going to talk to you about the first vision share with you some stories that aren't necessarily found, well, they aren't found in the hit in the Joseph Smith history in the Pearl of Great Price, but which are documented in other historical documents and references. As soon as I conclude with that, I'm going to take you all the way back to the beginning of our studies, verse 1 through 26, and I'm going to touch on something that the manual doesn't, and that's Joseph's family. You'll see in the early verses, he lists out, here's the names of all my siblings, and he rattles them all off, I'm going to answer the question of what happened to Joseph's siblings. Did they stay active in the church? Were they active in the church? What role did they play in the restoration? Did they stay active? What about in Nauvoo after the martyrdom? Did any of them go west? What was their faith and testimony like up to the day they died? I'm going to share that with you as well. So let's get started. Let's go back to one of the first miracles of the restoration, and that's getting the Smiths to Palmyra. Now, behind me is the Smith family farm as it looks in Palmyra today. This is the reconstructed log home that sits in, in, on the Smith family farm. When the church purchased the property, this home was no longer standing. But when they decided to um, dedicate the uh, uh, property and, or get it, and get it ready for dedication, uh, they decided to reconstruct this log home. And so glad that they did because so many wonderful things happened in this home 
most notably was the visitations of Moroni. Those are things that the Moroni stories I'm going to share with you next week. But this is the reconstructed home built on the same foundation, the exact same location that the Smiths resided when they got to Palmyra and when they got to the farm here in Palmyra. So here's how they got there. We take you back all the way to the 1600s by a man, a man by the name of Robert Smith, an ancestor of Joseph. He decides to get on a boat, sell to the New World. There's no such thing as America at the time. And he settles in Massachusetts. Well, several generations later, Joseph Sr., his father, moves the family and they go to Topsfield, Massachusetts. Why did they need to be in Topsfield, Massachusetts? Because there Joseph Sr. would befriend a band by the name of S Stephen Mack. Stephen Mack had a younger sister by the name of Lucy, Lucy Mack. S Joseph Sr. and Lucy Mack, they meet, they fall in love, they decide to raise a family. The parents of the restoration, or the parents of the prophet of the restoration. So we've got the mom and dad together and now they decide to farm. That's all they know how to do. For six years, they rent a piece of property to farm, and the farm produces nothing for six years. Six years go by. They have mouths to feed. They don't know what to do. They try their hand at, at, at a business, and the business fails it, miserably. In fact, it puts them into debt. So they decide, well, they're no good at doing business. Let's go back to what we do know, and that's farming. They find a little piece of property in Sharon, Vermont, that they can farm. The farming doesn't go so well. In fact, nothing good comes out of Sharon, except on December 23rd, 1805, Joseph Jr. is the fourth child, the third surviving child of the family, is born to Joseph Sr. and Lucy Mack. They named the boy on December 23rd, 1805, Joseph Jr., thus fulfilling prophecy that the prophet of the restoration would be named after not only Joseph of Egypt, but also his, or his father as well, who's Joseph Sr. at this point. Well, Sharon Vermont's not producing anything else as far as a crop, and so they decide to move, and they move to West Lebanon. Now, the problem in West Lebanon wasn't so much the farming, it was the typhoid fever. The typhoid fever struck the community, killing lots of people. It was, it was the pandemic, and it was a big-time pandemic, killing thousands of people, making it tens of thousands of people sick. And it was the strand of the typhoid that lodged itself in Joseph's leg. That's what gave Joseph all the leg problems. And you know that story of the, the surgeons coming in and extracting the infection out of the bone. He walked with a limp the rest of his life, but on crutches for a couple of years after that surgery. That's where this happened in his time, of, in this time of the story. Well, they get out of West Lebanon before the typhoid does any more harm to the family, and they move to Norwich, Vermont. In Norwich, Vermont, they start to farm. Things aren't going so well again, but in the year 1816, they start to get a crop coming out of the ground in June, but then a deep freeze, frost hits, and it kills everything, they replant, a deep frost comes, it hits in July. They replant, a deep frost comes and hits in August. Now, if you've ever been to New England here in America, you know that June, July, and August are miserably hot. And so it was not only unseasonably crazy, but it was just downright crazy that we kept having these frosts. Well, little did they know until the 1960s when the scientists figured out that Mount Tambora over in Asia blew its top, throwing smoke and ash and soot into the atmosphere, covering New England, changing the weather patterns. Why does all this matter? Because it was at this point in the story where Joseph Sr. gets frustrated and he doesn't know what to do. He's trying to do, just feed his family, take care of his family, do everything he knows how he can do. And it seems like everything's against him. It's, you know, we're starting to relate the story to ourselves now. We're doing everything we can that we know is right. And yet sometimes things just don't work out. And they weren't working out for the Smith family. But Joseph Sr. sees an advertisement in the newspaper for good fertile land way out west in Palmyra, New York. Joseph Sr. goes out, he checks it out, he writes a letter to Lucy, says, pack it up, bring the kids. I think we can make it here. They get to Palmyra. Now, let me stop in the story here for a second and introduce to you another story. And you're going to see how these two stories collide. And it's all the work of the, of the Lord. And as I told you, I think it's the first miracle of the restoration. So now we, so the second part of the story is Moroni, the last prophet historian in the Book of Mormon. Moroni is given the plates, the abridgment from his father Mormon in the year uh, 385 AD. He buries the plates in the hill in upstate New York in 421 AD. Now we do the quick math, we find out 36 years from the time he gets the plates until the time he buries the plates. And what's he doing for 36 years? We know exactly what he's doing because he tells us. 
I'm wandering whithersoever I can for the safety of mine own life. For the Lamanites will kill anyone who does not, who, who does not deny the Christ. And I, Moroni, I will not deny the Christ. And so he's wandering for his life, running perhaps at times for his life. Now, I don't know <clears throat> all the places Moroni went. I don't know where he started. I know where he ended up. And that's at the hill in, the, in upstate New York. But we think for a minute, he's wandering whether, whithersoever he can. He's got to be moving fast for the safety of his own life. If we liken him to the pioneers, the pioneers went 1,325 miles from winter quarters to Salt Lake. They did it in about 90 days. We did the quick division. It's about 14 miles a day. We say 14 miles a day attributed to Moroni. Over the course of the 36 years, he could have wandered upwards of 180,000 miles. Now, if he started in one place and ended up in another, or he started and ended in the same place, that's not my debate to have. But the opportunity to wander a long ways was there. The time was on his side. So we have Moroni here zigging and zagging and crossing and going everywhere, which way he could, perhaps. Joseph says that Moroni dedicated temple sites in, quote, the Great Basin, meaning the, Great, the Salt Lake Valley, Independence, Kirtland, and many other places we know not yet of. Brigham Young said that Moroni dedicated the temple sites in St. George and Manti. So wherever he was, he was moving, and he had time to do it. And finally, in 421 AD, he buries the plates in a hill in upstate New York. Now let's put these stories together. We have Moroni zigging and zagging all over the place, ends up at a hill. We have the Smiths zigging and zagging all over New England, and they end up very close to the very same hill 1,500 years later. I think Joseph sees the miracle of it all in his history when he says that the hill where the plates were deposited, that the hill was conveniently located. To his home. You see, after he was commanded by Moroni to go and see the plates, and we'll talk about that next week, he only had to walk two and a half miles from, from this home. He walks two and a half miles from this house down the road, and, and that's where the hill was. He says it was conveniently located. The miracle. So we got the Smiths into town. Well, they start farming, and they're doing everything they can to to put food on the table, to have enough money. Joseph's responsibility. You, you, you've heard that Joseph only had a third grade education. Why was that? Well, there was a school in town, but Joseph had to spend his time trying to make and help his parents' financial ends meet. And so he was always working. He had a lot of things to do, a lot of opportunity. And one of the opportunities that he had was to be in charge of the beer and cake cart in downtown Palmyra. Now, what the Smiths did is they, they made root beer and they made pastries. So you've got your beer and cake and you put it on a cart and you fold around downtown and try to sell you the, the, the items. And so Joseph was in charge of the beer and cake cart for a time. He, he did a number of other uh, jobs as well that we'll start talking about next week as he gets a little bit older and he's doing more work. Uh, and that's during the Moroni visit time period. But for the stories that we have today, we've got the Smiths now in Palmyra. We've got them here at the farm, and, uh, and, and the townspeople, everything around him starts to become alive with religious excitement. And these are the verses you're going to be reading this week. But let me take you, let me dissect them a little bit and share with you some of the stories behind the verses. And I think when I start, and when, when we start to learn and hear the stories behind the verses, we, we get a little bit more of a glimpse of what's going on in Joseph's mind. And it's not only which church should I join. And when we start to understand all the things that might have been going on and troubling this young boy's mind, we can start to say, oh, yeah, I see that too. And that's the whole point of this Beyond, beyond Come, Follow Me that I'm doing is we, we got to find how it's relatable and how we come closer to Christ while we learn about the history. So let's think about the Smith family in Moroni. If the Lord can take Moroni and put him all over wherever, and he takes the Smith family and puts them all over New England, and he puts them within two and a half miles of each other, they'll separate by 1,500 years. If the Lord can do all of that, just imagine what he can do for you and me in our own personal lives. 
Think about what the Lord has done, what the Lord is doing, what the Lord's going to do for each of us. And what a miracle that is, is it not? So here we have the uh, Smiths in Palmyra. We're ready to go. Okay. I keep delaying, but I'm no more delaying. We're going to move on to the next story. And that is leading up to the first vision. So let me take you through some of the, uh, the uh, uh, stories here of the verses that you're going to be reading and studying. Okay. I'm going to show you. picture here this picture uh, is be behind uh, this picture that you see is the famous intersection in Palmyra that has four churches one on each corner of this intersection you've got the Methodist the Presbyterians the Episcopal Church and the Baptist now right behind the Presbyterian Church is a Catholic Church none of these structures were here back in the 1820s but all of these structures are built on the site of churches that were there. So when you think about the church produced movies of Joseph slipping in and out of co different congregations, you can see how easy it actually was that the church productions weren't exaggerating the convenience of Joseph going from congregation to congregation. The oldest church here in the picture is the Presbyterian church. It was built back in 1832. Okay. So we've got a lot of churches in the Palmyra area. Everybody's really excited about it. How did it all happen? How did it all start? Let me take you to verse 5. So in verse 5, Joseph talks about an unusual excitement. There's an unusual excitement. There's a lot of religious excitement going on here in town. Some preachers saying low here and low there. But then before he gets to verse 6, it's almost as if he wants to backtrack and say, okay, this is what was happening in verse 5, but let me tell you what was going on before all this low here and low there. And it's very interesting. Verse 6. For notwithstanding the great love which the converts of these different faiths expressed at the time of their conversion, and the great zeal manifested by the respective clergy who were active in getting up and promoting this extraordinary scene of religious feeling in order to have everybody converted, as they were pleased to call it. Let's pause halfway through there and let's talk about the history of what's going on here. What the preachers did, they got together and it was a business deal. They got together and in planning for the summer of 1819, the first vision would happen in the spring of 1820. In the summer of 1819, these preachers get together and they strike a business deal, nothing more than that. And what it was is let's advertise this great excitement, this unusual excitement. We'll get everybody into town. All of us will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ as taught in the New Testament, the best they understood it, at least. And it doesn't matter which, which church everybody joins because everybody's going to be joining churches. And so there's going to be so many converts. It, it doesn't matter. We're not going to fight. We're going to promote it together. That's Joseph's word. We're going to, they're, they're going to promote it, bring all these new converts in, and their churches are going to flourish with new converts. It was a great idea, so they thought. And so the preachers went all in on it. In fact, there were 150 estimated preachers that descended into the Palmyra area. William Smith, the brother of Joseph, describes this, this scene with 150 or so preachers in a, what he calls a fair, F-A-I-R. What we would call it is a trade show where these preachers would line up like their booths and you could wander down the aisles of all these booths listening to all the different preachers. Well, so the business still is going pretty good. Everybody's getting, a lot of people are getting converted and they're starting to join churches. And so, so that, that's the first half of verse six. And uh, they were promoting uh, in order to have everybody converted as they were pleased to call, call it. And then they said, let them join what sect they please, right? That was the business deal. Let's all preach. Let the people decide what church they want to join. And we'll just let them join because there's going to be so many converts that we'll, we'll all be winners here in this business deal. Yet, when the converts began to file off, some to one party and some to the other, it was seen that the seemingly good feelings of both, both the priests and the converts were more pretended than real. For a scene of great confusion and bad feeling ensued, priests contending against priests, convert against convert, so that all their good feeling one for another, if they had any at all, was entirely lost in a strife of words and a contest about opinions. 14-year-old boy, he wants to know 
how to gain salvation. He's relying on these preachers, and he starts to like what he hears, but then he starts to notice contention. And he says, I don't like this, these vibes. I don't like the way it makes me feel. And he recognized it as not a good thing. In Book of Mormon scripture, we learned that contention is of the devil. And Joseph, long before the Book of Mormon was published, recognizes that important teaching, that contention's of the devil. And he recognized it, and he turned away from it. Not only, it, it, see, he didn't turn away from the churches just because he didn't know which church was true, although that's part of the story, an accurate part of the story. He, he started turning away because he saw that this was not of God. This is, doesn't inspire me to become more like Jesus Christ. I don't feel the spirit here. How do we relate that to our own lives? Every day, right? So we've got, uh, we, we move it to verse seven. So the, the business deal goes bad. I was in the 15th year. My family's uh, father's family was proselyted to the Presbyterian faith, et cetera, et cetera. So Joseph leaves downtown where all this confusion and strife is going on, where this, all this unchristlike action is being had, and he goes home to find what? Some of his families, have, some of his family members have joined the Presbyterian Church. Other members of his family have joined the Methodist Church. His dad and oldest brother Alvin, they decide to stay home on Sunday. They don't join any church. And so all the confusion and strife that Joseph was talking about downtown Palmyra has now been brought within the walls of his home. See, now Joseph is starting to think, well, I can't get a true answer, a straight answer from the preachers. I can't get it from the recent converts. My neighbors, my friends can't give me the truth. I can't even get the truth from mom and dad or my siblings. Now, nothing against them. But Joseph was recognizing where truth comes from. Actually, Joseph was recognizing at this point in his life where truth doesn't come from. Now we ask ourselves, what are we involved in every day where things are being thrown at us constantly? We're under a constant attack of information through technology. And how do we sift through it? This is, this is the sifting through of, of information of the 1820s. That Joseph's going through. So remember, this is actually 18, the summer of 1819. So Joseph has a lot of months to think on this thing until the spring of 1820. One preacher that Joseph liked hearing, and he kept returning to this one particular preacher frequently. Um, William Smith identified this situation that, that Joseph continued to go back to this one preacher. The one preacher preached one thing, and just one thing only every day, day in and day out. And that was James 1.5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Now, the preacher had it half right. He said, as, as all the preachers start fighting against each other, as described in verse 6, this preacher says, if you want to know which church to join, just pray and ask God. Do as James directs. And that's where the preacher has it right. But then he continues on, where he doesn't have it quite right, where he says, and when you do so, God will tell you to join my church. So this preacher had it half right. If you want to know how to sift through what's right and what's wrong, if you want to have a little discernment, you just have to do as James directs and pray and ask God. In verse 8, Joseph says that he's giving this serious reflection. Search, ponder, pray. He's actually doing it. He's meditating. He is seeking. He's desiring personal revelation. In verse 9, he, he's talking about the preachers again. They used all their powers to make the people think that they were in error. So the contention's rising. The preachers are saying, I must be right because all of you are wrong. All of you are wrong? That makes me right. And this just leads to more confusion. So Joseph, he hears this preacher, James 1.5, and he essentially thinks to himself, he's got to think to himself, is it that simple? Is it, is it really, can I just pray and ask God and I can have the answer that I'm seeking? In verse 12, he reads, he thinks, he studies, he ponders. Remember back in verse 8, he's saying he's doing these things about James 1.5. And he gets to verse 12 and he says, never did any passage of scripture 
come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. He was receiving personal revelation. He was getting the very thing that President Nelson is begging us as church members to get, personal revelation. And then he gets the revelation, and what does he do? I reflected on it again and again, knowing that if anybody needed wisdom from God, I did. For how to act, I did not know. And unless I could get more wisdom than I then had, I would never know. And so he decides in verse 13, at length, I come to the conclusion that I must remain in darkness and confusion, or I must do as James directs, and I must ask of God. In, in general conference not long ago, Elder Corbridge says this about Joseph's attempt. And yet, as anxious as he is, he doesn't run to a quiet corner and rattle off a hurried prayer. He's only 14, but in his haste to know, he is not hasty. This is not to be just any prayer. He decides where to go and when to make the attempt. He prepares to talk to God. This starts back in the summer of 1819. The first vision doesn't happen until the spring of 1820. He's got eight or ten months to think and ponder on this. And as, jo as Elder Corbridge points out, he it takes that time to prepare. Prepare to talk to God. In documented journals from other church leaders that were around at the time, they recorded that Joseph would tell them somewhat privately and in uh, somewhat informal situations. Multiple records show this, that Joseph admitted that when he went into the grove in the spring of 1820, he fully expected an answer to his prayer. Now, he didn't expect God the Father and Jesus Christ to appear, perhaps. But because of his preparation, he expected to come out of the grove with an answer to his prayer. And so it can be with us. What a lesson to prepare. I was a missionary in Australia. And during my time, I taught a lot of people how to pray. What I failed to do was teach people how to get an answer to their prayer. And Joseph had figured that out. So on the spring, in the spring of 1820, beautiful spring morning, Joseph decides to make the attempt. He leaves this home and he, he heads to the tree line behind the hills or behind the home. The trees behind this home, that's the sacred grove. And he leads, leaves this home. He heads into the sacred grove and he kneels down and begins to pray. Now, the adversary, he didn't go through the veil. He knew who Joseph was. He knew that Joseph was the chosen prophet, the individual who would re help restore the church of Jesus Christ and build that kingdom up. He knew that Joseph was going to be a deterrent to the adversary's kingdom. And the adversary made the attempt to stop Joseph from making this prayer. When Joseph was engulfed in trial, in misery, in darkness, in hardship, when he was at the point of wanting to give up, he kept praying. And by praying, he prayed himself out of that trial, out of that darkness, out of that hardship. And because he kept praying, when time was tough, as a result, he saw a light. Welcome to the Sacred Grove. It was here in the spring of 1820 that God the Father and his son Jesus Christ appeared to the young boy Joseph. It was through this and other experiences that Joseph was called to be a prophet of God and help restore the church of Jesus Christ to the earth today. Now, before continuing on with our story, with our historical stories, it's important for me to clarify the word vision and its true definition coming from the 1820s. See, when we think of the word vision today, we think of something that we have perhaps while we're asleep, a dream maybe. Or when we speak of a vision while we're awake, it's something that we hope for. We envision the future to be a particular 
certain way. But if you check out the 1828 Webster's Dictionary to find out what the word vision meant when Joseph used the word vision, you find that the definition is very different. It's a very simple, very short definition, and it's this. Actual sight. And that's important to remember, particularly this whole year as we study the Doctrine and Covenants, that whenever Joseph or somebody else from early church history uses the word vision, it's not being used the way we would use the word vision today. It means actual sight. And so by definition, when Joseph came here to this grove, he didn't have a vision of Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. He had actual sight. And that's significant. He did, in reality, speak to them face to face. Now, the adversary tried to stop all this. And what did Joseph do? He prayed his way out of the problem. And by praying, he saw a light. And in his own words, he says this, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, this is my beloved son, hear him. President Nelson has said this about the first vision. Quote, if Joseph Smith's transcendent experience in the sacred grove teaches us anything, it is that the heavens are open and that God speaks to his children. The prophet Joseph Smith set a pattern for us to follow in resolving our questions, drawn to the promise of James that if we lack wisdom, we may ask of God. The boy Joseph took his question directly to Heavenly Father. He sought personal revelation, and his seeking opened this last dispensation. In like manner, President Nelson continues, what will your seeking open for you? What wisdom do you lack? What do you feel an urgent need to know or understand? Follow the example of the prophet Joseph. Find a quiet place where you can go regularly. Humble yourselves before God. Pour out your heart to your Heavenly Father. Turn to Him for answers and for comfort. Pray in the name of Jesus Christ about your concerns, your fears, your weaknesses. Yes, the very longings of your heart. And then listen. Write the thoughts that come to your mind. Record your feelings and follow through with actions that you are prompted to take. As you repeat this process day after day, month after month, Year after year, you will grow into the principle of revelation, end quote. I'd like to share something with you. I, I have visited the Sacred Grove many times. Now, certainly I don't say that to brag, as I know it's a great opportunity to visit the Grove. It's an opportunity that most members of the church throughout the world will never have. And so I don't take it for granted. I certainly don't try to take it for granted, but... I need to tell you that I've been there a lot of times in order to drive home a point. And that is to share with you how the Grove feels. I've been there every month of the year. I've been to the Grove where I've had to walk through snow in the wintertime. I've been there in the fall time and watched the purple and yellow and orange leaves fall to the ground. I've been there in the summertime where the gnats and mosquitoes are so thick that you can't swat your hand fast enough to protect yourself. I've also been there in the springtime and in, in the pouring rain. I've been there and greeted by butterflies and birds, deer, uh, uh, frogs, and even wild turkeys. I've also been there when it seems like there's a carousel of people just filing, shuffling through the grove. But I've also been there on days where I found a quiet bench deep in the grove and for two or more hours, so I've never seen another person. But despite all the circumstances of the surrounding, the weather, the amount of people, the animals that are there, the weather, uh, I said weather, but the temperature and everything that goes with it, despite all of that, the one thing that is constant every single time I've been there is the feeling. Many people have said to me that the way they fill in the grove or the way that the grove fills is the same as that fills in the temple. And I would agree with them. Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ have been to that particular wooded area. And so it is sacred. It's hallowed ground. When I started first going to the 
sacred grove, I would recognize the feeling as the spirit telling me that what Joseph said happened there really did happen, that he did see Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ and was called to be a prophet. But as I have visited more and listened perhaps a little more carefully, the spirit seems to whisper a little something different. And that is that Jesus Christ lives, that this is his church. And because he lives, the atonement is real. Now, why do I get those thoughts and feelings in the sacred grove? I've thought about that. And the answer that I've come up with is that we have an eyewitness to the divinity of Jesus Christ. You see, if you have a testimony that the first vision happened, then by default, you and I and everybody else that has a testimony of the first vision must accept the fact that Jesus Christ is a resurrected being because Joseph saw him. And if Jesus Christ is a resurrected being, that means that he completed a perfect atonement. And because the Savior appeared to Joseph, and we understand that by default, the atonement is real, it's completed, it's available, we know that all the teachings of the atonement must therefore be correct as well. In quoting a church production, quote, And because he lives, if you reach out, call out, cry out, he is here. Then, now, always, he is here. During the good, the bad, and the in-between, he is here. No matter who you are or who you were, he is here. No exceptions, no lost causes, at all times, at all places, he is here. End quote. With the atonement completed, it's referred to in the Book of Mormon as an infinite atonement. Infinite in what? What does that mean? I would suggest a few things. Infinite in power, infinite in scope, in time, in depth, in compassion, infinite in perfect love. When Joseph is able to compose himself, gather his strength and energy, he leaves the grove and he heads home. And he's leaning upon the, fi the fireplace mantle, deep in thought, no doubt. And his mother approaches him and to inquire, what, what's the matter, Joseph? You're not acting like yourself. And in the, in the verses that we're studying this week, he says, it's quoted as him saying, never mind, all is well. I am well enough off. He then continues by telling his mother that I have learned for myself that Presbyterianism is not true. I would like to break that apart a little bit. Never mind, I am well enough off. He's satisfied, to, to, at least to a point, to an extent. He's received an answer and he's comforted by that. Perhaps the troubled mind that he'd been experiencing in the last eight to ten months is has been satisfied to a point, but at least calmed, where he has, has found peace, at least with it all. But then the second part, I have learned for myself. In all those verses that we're studying this week, he talks about the confusion, the strifes, the low here and the low there. I, I told you the history that the, the 150 preachers all preach in somewhat different things. His friends, his neighbors, they can't agree on anything. Even within his own household, he's got Presbyterianisms, Presbyterians, and he's got Methodists, and he's got people that don't go to church at all. And all of that confusion goes away as soon as he learns for himself. He went to the source of truth. And so it can be for us in any truth that we're seeking. Uh, Mar uh, Moroni says, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. Now, it's been my experience and the experience that I've witnessed in others that one does not have to come to the sacred grove in upstate New York in order to gain a testimony that these things are true. Moroni says, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things, including whether or not the first vision took place. So our challenge, brothers and sisters, as members of the church, is not to pray to uh, not to follow Joseph's example and pray to know which church to join. We've already done that, as member, and and now we're members of the church. But our challenge now is to do as Joseph did and seek truth 
by praying to our Heavenly Father, who will reveal that truth to us, as testified and taught by James and by Moroni. I know these things are true. I have prayed to gain an understanding and a testimony of this truthfulness, and I've received that witness. And I say it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
I'm standing again in front of the Smith family log home on the farm in Palmyra. I told you at the beginning of the recording that I was going to share with you the rest of the story regarding Joseph's siblings. In verse four of the verses that we're studying this week in our Come Follow Me lessons, Joseph just rattles off the names of all of his siblings really quickly. But have you ever wondered about Joseph's siblings? What role did they play in the process of the restoration? Did they have testimonies of the work? And perhaps most importantly, what became of them? What was the rest of the story? Did they die with testimonies? Did they, any of them go west to Utah? Let me answer those questions for you briefly here. I'll take one sibling at a time. I'll, I'll go in the order that Joseph listed them. First was Alvin. Alvin was the oldest child and, um, and he was Joseph's hero. When Joseph came out of the grove and he started to speak about the first vision, it was Alvin that defended him. It stuck up for his little brother. He relied on Alvin. He trusted Alvin. And he loved Alvin. Tragically, in the year 1823, Alvin passed away. Now, 1823 is a date that you probably can have heard of. It's certainly the date we're going to be speaking a lot about next week when we talk about the Moroni visits. For in 1823, that's when Moroni visited Joseph for the first time in the upstairs bedroom of this log home that's behind me. Well, in 1823, Shortly after that first visit of Moroni, Alvin is about to pass away. He's here in this log home on the first floor in the master bedroom, and he invites each sibling in to bid him farewell and for him to give the, uh, a, a challenge, uh, counsel to his siblings. It's Joseph's turn to come into the room. Alvin tells him this, quote, I want you to be a good boy and do everything that lies in your power to obtain the record. Be faithful in receiving instruction and, keep, and in keeping every commandment that is given you. He then passes away. For 13 years, the Smith family doesn't know what to make of Alvin's passing, other than what the preachers tell him, them, and that is that Alvin, because he didn't go to church, he's, he's in hell, is what they were told. That's all they knew how to believe, knew what to believe. It wasn't until 13 years later that Joseph Smith is in the upstairs room of the Kirtland Temple, and he receives a vision. Remember what vision means, actual sight, and it's now recorded in section 137. In section 137, Joseph sees Alvin in the celestial kingdom and learns that anyone who would have received the gospel, had they known about it in this life, they'll be heirs of the celestial kingdom. Alvin believed his little brother's testimony. And that's what he said on his deathbed. Do everything that's in your power to obtain the record. The record was still in the hill two and a half miles down the road. Alvin never saw the, the plates. He never read the transcript of it. But he believed his little brother's testimony. And that was good enough to punch his ticket to the celestial kingdom. Hiram is the next brother. We don't have to go into much history of, a, of Hiram. But when Alvin passes away, Hiram steps into that role. That, Al, that was left void with Alvin's death in being the friend, the protector of Joseph. Of Hiram, John Taylor said this, If ever there was an exemplary, honest, and virtuous man, an embodiment of all that is noble in the human form, Hiram Smith was its representative. What an amazing tribute. He, John Taylor continues in, his, in what's recorded now is section 135. Speaking of Joseph, but also with the thought of Hiram, he lived great and he died great in the eyes of God and his people. And like most of the Lord's anointed in ancient times, he, he has sealed his mission and his works with his own blood. And so has his brother Hiram. In life, they were not divided and in death, they were not separated. Next comes Samuel. Samuel was faithful. And he loved his older brother. He, he was in Harmony, Pennsylvania, uh, when Joseph and Oliver were baptized. Stories I'm going to tell you in, in the coming weeks. But Samuel was there. And when Joseph approached Samuel and invited him to be baptized, Samuel said, I don't think I have the faith to do that. Joseph, the wise older brother, says, why don't you pray about it? Samuel spent the next couple of days praying about it. He comes to Joseph and he says, why did I ever doubt what I always knew to be true? And with that, Joseph baptized his little brother Samuel. Samuel was always faithful to his testimony. He's credited as being the first missionary called after the organization of the church on April 6, 1830. Next comes William. William was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in Kirtland. But William had a hard time having the relationship of apostle president of the church relationship with his brother. He maintained a much more traditional 
brotherly relationship. And sometimes that led to conflict, uh, as sometimes it does with brothers. Well, William seems to at times be jealous of, of Joseph and, uh, and he made it known publicly. Anyway, they, they didn't have a falling out, but they had kind of a rough, kind of rocky relationship. But William stayed with the family through the Kirtland era, through the Missouri era, and then ended up in Nauvoo with the family. But shortly after they got to Nauvoo, William decided that he wanted to aspire to be a politician. He left the state of Illinois, or he left Nauvoo, the city of Nauvoo, to go be a politician. And he, he did that almost for the rest of his life. He wasn't in Nauvoo at the time of the martyrdom. But he eventually moved back near Nauvoo. He settled across the Mississippi River in Iowa, across the, across the river from Nauvoo, Illinois. And near the end of his life, in the year 1888, he decides to write his own personal history. Now, mind you, this is 44 years after the martyrdom. And he writes this in his personal history. Quote, Joseph Smith, my older brother, was a prophet of God, and the Book of Mormon is true. So 50 to 60 years after his disassociation with the church, he goes to his grave testifying that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God and the Book of Mormon is true. Next comes Don Carlos, faithful in every sense of the definition of the word faithful. Tragically, he died young at the, in 1841, shortly after the saints got to Nauvoo. Now, let's think about this for a second with Lucy. She loses, Lucy's the mother. She loses her husband, Don Carlos. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Samuel. He ends up dying a month after the martyrdom. Samuel, I just talk, told you about Samuel. He dies a month after the martyrdom. So in, in four short years, he, she loses her husband. Don Carlos, and then Joseph and Hiram, and then Samuel. And that's in addition to the infant child she, she buried years earlier as well. But through it all, she stayed faithful and never doubted that Emily Father was watching over that family. So next comes Sophronia, the, the sisters. Sophronia had a testimony and a deep love of the gospel of Jesus Christ. She went with the family all, all through all those tri trials to all those different locations, ending up in Nauvoo. She married a man in the Nauvoo temple. She was sealed to that man, so, evidence of her testimony. The record indicates that Sophronia and her husband were making preparations to move west with the saints. She was going to follow Brother Brigham and head to Salt, the Salt Lake Valley. Tragically, Sophronia's husband died just before they were uh, ready to go. Sophronia, in her situation, she's now a widow. She's got a mother who's a widow, of course, and uh, um, she's got a mother that's a widow, and, and also the, her, her sister-in-law, Emma, is now a widow as well, and she felt that it was her place to stay in Nauvoo and help care for, for the family, so she didn't go west, although she had plans and intentions to do so. Next, we come to Catherine. Catherine, again, was very faithful. It's recorded multiple times in her journal that she was praying. This was after the Nauvoo era. She was still living in Nauvoo, but after the saints left Nauvoo, it's recorded in her handwriting, in her journal, that she was praying for Brother Brigham and the other saints for their successes. She had a love for, for Brigham and the other saints as recorded, Lucy was the baby. Lucy was born in 1821, a year after the first vision. So she grew up her whole life having the restoration in her life. Her nephew, Joseph Fielding Smith, who would become a, a prophet, a president of the church, and who was the son of Hiram. So Lucy's nephew, Joseph F. Smith, records in his journal about the several visits that he made to Nauvoo as a grown man when he was heading east on on uh, missions. The missionaries who were going east would often stop in um, Nauvoo and even in, in Kirtland uh, to make visits to those early church sites. And Joseph Fielding would always stop in Nauvoo to visit his niece, Lucy. And in his journal, he records that in every visit, Lucy, his aunt, would take Joseph F. Smith's hands and press them against her face and weep. Joseph Fielding Smith's excuse me, Joseph F. Smith's um, interpretation 
of this act was that Lucy longed to be with family and with the saints. She missed the church. Of the people who knew Joseph best, his siblings, they believed him. They trusted him. They knew that he was a truthful, honest young man, and they all went to their graves teaching and testifying of his prophetic role. What a wonderful testimony from the Smith family. Do you see why I love these verses, these early verses, verse 1 through 26, found in the Joseph Smith history? These messages, these truths are real. They're the foundation of everything that we're going towards. In the next video, we're going to talk about the Moroni visits. We're going to get Joseph out of Palmyra and on to other things. Priesthood keys and powers and authorities are going to be rest, uh, restored. The Book of Mormon is going to be translated and published. Missionaries are going to take it far and wide. The church is going to be organized and wonderful blessings and revelation and knowledge is going to be poured out upon the saints as the Lord promised in the Doctrine and Covenants. And I'm excited to share it all with you. The video link that's now appearing will take you to last week's uh, lesson that I did, Beyond Come Follow Me lesson, where we focused on the history behind Doctrine and Covenants section one. The icon or the picture of the uh, Kirtland Temple, well, you click that, that gets you to subscribe so that you get the next week and all the videos that I have. But if you want to go back and see the archive or the library of all these videos, then you can go to the blog where I've got them all stored, and that's tomcpettit.com. Uh, with that, I hope you have a wonderful week studying these sacred verses, and I hope they are inspiring and uplifting and motivating as I think they were intended to be. And with that, I thank you, and I look forward to visiting with you next week.